Welcome to our fifth Network Book Forum in our series, Spotlighting Nice White Ladies, The Truth About White Supremacy, Our Role in It, and How We Can Help Dismantle It, by DNS alumna, Jesse Daniels. I'm Sarita Amrude, Principal Researcher and Program Director of the Race and Tech Fellowship at Data and Society, here with another of our alumnae, Mutali Conde. I will be your host alongside my colleagues, Nazali and Rigo, behind the curtain. Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. Data and Society began in New York City, an island node in a large network of hills, rivers, and mountains in the Atlantic Northeast known as Lenape Hoking, the ancestral land of the Lenni Lenape people. Today, we are connected online via a different network, a vast array of servers, humans, and computers. In the United States, much of the system sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. As an organization, we recognize this history and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory around the world. We commit to dismantling all ongoing settler colonial practices and their material implications on our digital world. Nice White Ladies is a new book by Jesse Daniels, who is professor of sociology at Hunter College and the Graduate Center CUNY. Today, she'll be joining us to talk about her most recent book, Nice White Ladies, published in October by Seal Press. The book got a starred review from Kirkus and was included on their list of best nonfiction of 2021. Kiesi Lehman, author of Heavy, an American memoir, said of the book, this nation has never, ever read anything like nice white ladies. Daniels writes with what is rarely spoken, I'd love to live in a world where every white woman on earth reads this book. It could change everything. We are also joined by another 2018-2019 data, data and Society Fellow, Mutali Mkonde founder and CEO of AI for the People, a communications firm that seeks to add a technical analysis to racial justice discourse. In 2019, she was part of a team that introduced the Algorithmic Accountability Act to the US House of Representatives. And in 2020, she became a member of the TikTok Content Moderation Advisory Board. She writes widely on race and technology and this year contributed to an upcoming an anthology on tech governance to be published by MIT Press. Jesse, I'll pass it on to you. Thanks so much, Sarita. I really appreciate that uh, wonderful introduction. And I'm going to quickly move to share my screen. So thank you so much for everyone who's come through today. It's so wonderful to be here again with my uh, Data and Society colleagues. Um, I wanted to start out with a little um, introduction about the book and sort of talking about who is a nice white lady, because this is a question that I get a lot about the book and that seems a reasonable question. And really my answer to this question is that we all are nice white ladies. Part of the point of the title of the book is to disrupt all three of these categories, if you will, what it means to be nice, what it means to be white, and what it means to be a lady. Um, I also wanted to, at the outset here, just say a little something about um, DEI efforts, that is um, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And I know that folks at Data and Society have been doing a lot of work around that um, in, in the last uh, few months. And, and part of the project of the book is also to disrupt the way that we usually think about race and DEI in organizations. What typically happens um, across the US when it comes to DEI is that predominantly white organizations will when they um, want to address uh, the inequity in their organization, will bring in a person of color to address um, issues about racism. And then that person as a consultant leaves. And then the organization itself is not really transformed in any particular way because we haven't really examined our own practices in terms of you know, oftentimes a white lady run organizations. So this book is meant to make that, uh, make that shift from only situating the problem of race as with people of color and put it back to where it really belongs as um, a problem that we ourselves have created but often don't understand. So 
it's right now in the US, it's a kind of uncomfortable time to be a white woman. There are lots of comedians who will make jokes at our expense. There was a, a comedian named Bill Burr who talked on, who had a, a gig on Saturday Night Live and in his monologue, which was very funny, uh, was calling out white women who in their Gucci boots had uh, elbowed their way to the front of the woke movement, whatever that might be. And uh, and I was laughing along with it, um, along with everyone else until he got to the point about how uh, white women should shut up and sit down next to him and take their talking to. And I thought, well, that gets a big middle finger salute from me. I'm not gonna have some cis het white man tell me to sit down and shut up. In the same year, there, that Halloween, there was another um, white male artist who created the Karen masks. He said that he, uh, looking around the landscape, he decided that Karens were the scariest things um, in, the, uh, in the world at the time. And there's another version of this mask with sores on her face and she's the COVID Karen. And she has that um, distinctive haircut that we've all come to associate with this meme. A lot of white women have pushed back against this meme saying that it's misogynist. And I do think that there's something to that argument when it's coming from straight white men. I think that um, there is, however, valid uh, pushback in the, in the Karen meme. And we can talk about that uh, in a little bit. Um, there are other um, thought leaders, we might call them like David Brooks at the New York Times, who is all about defending white women, um, as if he uh, linked to a piece that was on the New York Post about workshops for what's up with white women. And his take on it was as if all the white women in the world were somehow one category. And this is kind of a uh, pushback that I've gotten about the book. Certainly, I'm not arguing that all white women are the same. Um, my friend and colleague, uh, Natasha Stovall, does a wonderful piece talking about whiteness on the couch. And she writes about, you know, is this, is it farm to table uh, whiteness or is it cracker barrel whiteness? And I do a similar riff in the book. Is it uh, about gender, right? Is it Martha Stewart whiteness or is it Paula Dean whiteness? Is it American businesswoman Ivanka Trump whiteness or is it uh, American businesswoman Sheryl Sandberg whiteness? So the point of the book is not to put all white women in one category, but it's to call attention to that in academia, we would say that subject position. What does it mean to be a white woman? Um, sometimes I will have my students do an assignment where they go back through the Vanity Fair Hollywood issue and look at all the white women on the featured on the uh, covers there. There are occasionally black women like Kerry Washington or Lupita Nyong'o who appear, but there's so few, it really makes the point that this is really um, a, a focus on white women. But how can we, uh, a la David Brooks, not talk about white women as a category if we are everywhere in the culture, but nowhere in our analysis? How can we understand the subject position of white woman if we can't talk about it? And that's really the project of this book is to talk about what it means to be a white woman today. So quickly wanna just situate myself. I come from a long line of women who identified as white and, um, and I can talk about my family later. This is me as the baby, my uh, great grandmother, my uh, who we call little granny, my my grandmother we call big granny, who's about a couple inches taller. And then that's my mother Shirley there. Um, a lot of what I learned from my uh, from the women in my family was that if there is a mess, you clean it up. In a lot of ways, I think of settler colonialism and white supremacy as the mess that we have to clean up. On my father's side, I also came from. You know, my father who believed himself to be Cherokee, but was not, and his father who um, had been in the Klan, I discovered much later, and had also molested me as a child. And I saw those two things as linked and wrote about it in the preface to White Lies. So I want to move quickly to the book, and I'm going to speed through some key arguments here, and we'll talk about these together, uh, but I'm going to go through these really quickly. So the opening line of the book is nice white ladies and our protection are fundamental to American culture and it's destroying all of us. And I really believe that this is um, true that we, that the way that we think about being nice white ladies, the way that we think about whiteness is really corrosive to us. Those of us who are raised to believe in our own whiteness and are raised to be um, femme identified and, and to raised in that ladyhood tradition, it really is corrosive for us, but it's also damaging to the culture as a whole. And yeah, the, the takes on it are often these kinds of facile um, journalistic takes about why do white women keep voting against their own interests? And my argument is that they're not voting against their own interests, that whiteness is in fact their interest. And whiteness shapes all our lives, but those of us who are raised to be white, we're not practiced at noticing whiteness. This is what Charles Mills has called the epistemology of ignorance. 
Um, whiteness shapes how we approach feminism. Certainly Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In has been critiqued for this. And it's happening right now. This is an article from yesterday at The Atlantic uh, where a prominent scholar is writing about the recent um, uh, leak from SCOTUS saying this is the new Jane Crow, which is really about white women. Um, and it's about how we reflect on the past. This is a play that's in production right now at the public in New York City about the suffragist movement. And it's, it really centers white women's story in a really problematic way. Um, whiteness also shapes how we date, how we swipe right and match. Um, we know from dating um, um, app evidence that there is a strong preference among white women for dating white men, uh, presumably to form um, white families and have white children. It, whiteness shapes how we think of who is a good mother in popular culture like the blind side and in prominent figures like uh, Princess Diana. Whiteness shapes the families that we create and the wealth that we pass on to them. And not just these families who are easy to dunk on, but families like these who look more like me and are probably people I'm connected to in some way. Um, and the way that we think about protecting our families. There's a wonderful podcast I hope, you, I hope you've listened to called Nice White Parents. And the book is meant to be a kind of riff on that title. And, and in this, the reporter Ch Chana Joffe Walt does an excellent job of interviewing progressive, liberal, white women in New York City who are all for school integration, except when it comes to their own children. And whiteness shapes how we protect our homes and who we see as a threat. These are the McCloskeys from um, St. Louis, Missouri, and their approach to protecting their home, uh, which was described as a palazzo in St. Louis as peaceful Black Lives Matter protesters walked by, was to go outside with weapons, safeties off, uh, loaded, and point them at these uh, peaceful protesters. And in some ways, it's very easy to laugh at these two, but they're really um, uh, emblematic of the way that we approach families and homes as white women. It also, whiteness also shapes how we think about summoning help for protection. The whole 911 system is really based on the protection of white women and white people. It was a response to civil rights protests and the Kitty Genovese murder, which we could talk more about. And it affects how we're dying. Jonathan Metzl in 2019 has this marvelous book called Dying of Whiteness about the politics of whiteness and how white identity gets attached to certain policies. You could think about guns, which he talks about, how white people are so attached to their guns, they don't wanna let go of them. And since his book came out, right, we have the COVID epidemic, you think about white people who refuse to wear masks because their identity is somehow threatened by that. Metzl calls whiteness an illness of the mind weaponized onto the body of the nation. And there is a way in which this is affecting how white women are dying. There is that right now this epidemiological mystery about rising suicide rates among middle-aged white women in the US, which middle-aged in this context um, starts about 45 and goes to 65. And this has been a dramatic uptick in the last uh, couple of decades. Part of that has been this deaths of despair that people talk about, which is about opioid deaths and often linked to the white working class. But what doesn't get talked about here is really gender and race, why white women are particularly uh, affected by this. Epidemiologists don't have an explanation, but I think I do. I think there's a way in which we as white women kind of expire on a way, in a way in popular culture once we hit middle age. We no longer have that youthful uh, attractiveness that is valuable in the culture of a patriarchal white supremacist culture. And therefore um, our value um, maybe internally begins to decline. I write in the book that as women and particularly white women, we think the bargain is this, be nice, channel light and love and everything will work out. But the real bargain is actually be nice, don't speak up because our collective silence and specifically the silence of white women facilitates the continued smooth operation of oppressive systems. And this has affected me personally as well because I really believe this is part of what ended my mother's life. This is my mother, Shirley, um, and the foes taken about 1979. She died in 1983 um, because she took her own life. Part of that was about a terrible upbringing that was filled with a kind of imaginative sadism from her mother um, that I think really has its roots in slavery. It also came from um, you know, the way that gender constrained her life, but it also had something to do with the way that she bought into whiteness. And that was a real, um, in, in some ways it's a fraud that um, 
that uh, constricted her life and, and made it harder. So we don't wanna all end up like uh, my mother, I certainly don't. Um, and so the book is really meant to help us get beyond that. What I argue is that we have to divest from whiteness um, so that we can become more fully human and we can stand in solidarity with our fellow humans. And I just wanna end with this kind of inspiring story about Pia Klemp, who is a German um, uh, biological scientist and she uh, works on something called the Sea Shepherd which uh, rescues um, the oceans, right? It's working on saving the, the climate and specifically around oceans. And while she was doing that work, people who were refugees from Syria were in boats in the ocean and she and her crew rescued them, brought them into their boat to save their lives, which is something we would all do as if we were acting out of our full humanity. And then when the French government wanted to give her an award for that, she refused the award because she said, what I did doesn't deserve a medal. It's what we should all be doing if we're standing in solidarity with each other. So that's what that's my hope for this book is that we'll all be more like Pia Klemp and that we'll stand in solidarity with our other fellow human beings. Thanks so much. And I look forward to the conversation with Sarita and Mutali. Thank you so much um, for that, Jesse. And Sarita, I am so happy that we're going to be in conversation. I've missed you since I've been gone. Wow. In the interest of full disclosure, Jesse and I are friends. And even though she says that she wrote this book for everybody else, I truly believe that she wrote it for me because I am someone that does not understand nice white ladies. So I appreciate that. The way I really want to um, start the discussion, though, is by going back to the book and asking you um, really about something that stuck out to me on page 78. You write white, you describe white feminism as a war machine and specifically around um, necropolitics and this idea that white women um, in US society, even though I would say that this is probably true in the UK uh, where I grew up, are often given these um, the power of over, over who lives and who, who dies. And um, I can't help but think that as we look down the barrel at the death of Roe, that part of that has been this white female face of the family and you know, saving the babies and, um, and, and all of that. And my question for you is um, for you to kind of discuss that further, but certainly in the question of why, why is it so often that white women are given this place and why are they often um, linking it to the family as you put in your slide deck around school or security um, as you put in the slide deck um, with our friendly gun-toting neighbor? Yeah, thanks so much for that uh, question and the, and the close read of the book. And of course I wrote it for you. Um, so yeah, so white feminism absolutely is a war machine. There are ways in which the, if you think, let's just talk about popular culture, right? So uh, a very popular TV show that's on right now is, um, or has been on recently is uh, Madam Secretary, right? With the, with the lovely Taya Leone, right? And, and she's, she's kind of an avatar for sort of Madeleine Albright who just passed and, and Hillary Clinton sort of first, first woman as Secretary of State, right? And, and we're supposed to see her, you know, Taya Leone, that character and, and also these other women as kind of feminist role models, right? But, but if we think about what they're actually doing, they're an arm of the state. And part of their job is to, is to sign off on the murder and execution of brown people across the globe. I mean, that's really part of what they're, they're doing. Um, and so, and yet for many feminists, I, I'm gonna say here white liberal feminists, that ascent to power is seen as an unproblematic victory. Oh, she's secretary of state, that's a feminist win. You know, and I think that we have to begin to rethink that, right? It's the same kind of dynamic that's happening now with um, Amy Coney Barrett, right? One of the Supreme Court justices and, and my guess, the one behind the domestic supply of infants phrase. Um, but, but recently there's a protest in front of her house and the, the women are dressed in the sort of um, handmaid's tail outfits, right? Going past her house, right? And, and conservatives are saying, how can they be protesting Amy Coney Barrett when she's a feminist heroine? And I'm like, well, if, if these are your feminist heroines, then we have a very different understanding of feminism, right? So, so we have to think about what it is we're defining as feminism. Is it simply equality with white men who are located within a 
capital, racial capitalist, white supremacist um, uh, system? Is that the equality we want? Or do we want a different uh, social organization, right? That's, that's really the question about, and, and part of how we have to divest from that notion of feminism as a war machine. That's not, that's not progress for anyone, right? That's not the feminism that I want to be a part of. And then your question about families is really a, a, a key part of the book. I have a whole chapter about white families. Um, and, and part of what, and I've talked about this since my early work in the book, White Lies, it came out in 1997. In that early book, I'm talking about um, extremist white supremacists who have, you know, we're publishing these newsletters that went out through the, the postal mail service. And in those, they often valorized the white family, you know, put the white family up as like, this is the thing that we're really fighting for. Their rhetoric was um, equally about pro-white family and about, um, you know, as much as it was about anti-Semitism and racism. And that shifted around in the, in the culture as a whole, that shifted around the, the early 1990s when I'm talking here about uh, the anti-abortion fight, it shifted and became uh, really joined with white supremacy in the early 90s when um, white supremacists began to see Catholics rather than rather than seeing them as other and as opponent, began to re -under, reconfigure Catholics as white and uh, also concerned with kind of uh, an ethno-nationalist Christianity. And so um, in the 90s, we had these, um, you know, abortion clinic bombings, but those were often uh, conducted by people who were avowed white supremacists. And that connection between kind of protecting the family, which is really code for protecting the white family, has been consistent in the anti-abortion fight since then. Sometimes it's very overt and explicitly stated. And then other times it's kind of hidden and under the surface and in this coded language, as with the um, domestic supply of infants, which really the only word missing there is white, because that's really the implication of that phrase, right? Is where is the is the court, the the justices that wrote that brief are concerned that there aren't going to be a, enough white babies. And what is enough um, to meet replacement levels, right? So to to re to ensure that white hegemony continues in the US. That's really what that is. There's also something that goes on with families that is uh, ideologically um, useful because it's so hard to say anything um, that's critical of families, right? <laughs> Ask me how I know that. But people will come for you if you say things that are critical of white families um, because they are seen as sacrosanct. Like even people on the progressive left are like, well, you can't, how, how can you say anything bad about families? We wanna, we wanna support families. And that's really um, missing the kind of violence that white families do, both in terms of hoarding opportunities and in uh, passing on that unfair advantage to their children. So just one quick example about that. One of the arguments I make in the book is that we could wipe out the racial wealth gap in this country in a generation if white families would simply stop passing on their unfair advantage in housing equity to their children. So I talk about one of the, one of the things that a personal experience I had years ago, doesn't matter, uh, a friend of a friend that I worked with um, got an inheritance from her parents and was able to buy an entire brownstone as a single family dwelling. When we were both working as you know, assistant professors and making not enough money to buy a brownstone on. You know, and it was just like really clear to me. There was like, oh, if your parents die properly in a white middle-class way, they leave you money from the money that they got from redlining and housing prices that were stored up in white neighborhoods, right? And, and she will inevitably go on and pass that money to her children, right, who are white. And that's what's at the root of the racial wealth gap, really. Um, and so, so I argue for families to stop passing on that unfair advantage to their children. And I've had lots of white women come back at me and say, well, I can't possibly do that. And, and if I'm not doing that, does that mean I'm not doing the work? And that's not what I mean. Um, but if you can't do that personally on an individual level, then you need to be working for reparations on a, on a, on a federal level. You need to be working for abolition on a, on, at scale. Um, and then 
And then you might reflect on your own individual decisions about what you do with your money. Thank you so much. That's that's such a rich answer. So I would uh, I would love to move a little bit from this discussion about the family as a war machine and the history of eugenics and, and wealth um, to the specific question of technologies. So what I'd like to ask you about are the multiple technologies that show up in the work in the book and the relationship of technology to whiteness and feminism. So as you showed mm. in your slides, you have a critique of Sheryl Sandberg's lean in philosophy as a kind of individualizing liberal feminism that re-entrenches racist and sexist power structures. And you tell us the history of some technologies like the 911 call that were invented as a response to society's fantasy about white women's innocence. And related mm -hmm. to your earlier book, Cyber Racism, you describe the active use of internet technologies by white supremacist women, just to name a few examples. Can you tell us a little bit about how technology works in your book? And are there counter examples of liberation technologies that you've also mm -hmm. found in your research and practice? Yeah, that's a, that's a great um, set of questions and enough for another book. <laughs> but I mean, I think that um, there are lots of ways that technology works in the, um, in the book. I, want, I think I want to start with the 911 system because it's such, a, it's such a rich example and I've actually done more research on it since the book. So it feels a little fresher in my mind. Um, so 911 uh, started the, the idea of a universal call system to summon police. Um, is a, a relatively new idea historically. And in the United States, certainly in my lifetime, I grew up without 911, it didn't exist. And if you wanted to summon you know, state authorities, you had to find a seven digit number and know who your local police precinct was to be able to call, right? Um, and, and what happened was that in the 60s, as the United States government was engaged in imperial um, actions in Latin America, um, in Venezuela, there was a move to create, to put down a, an insurgency um, that the United States government wanted to repress. There was a CIA agent working in Venezuela who said, what we really need is a way for people in the countryside to be able to summon the militia on a moment's notice so that we can put down these uprisings. So that was in the early 60s. And that individual brought that um, idea back to the United States and began a sort of campaign around the US to try and to institute a national uh, emergency response number that was just three digits. And there were different digits in the beginning. Um, and then, so that was in the early 60s. Around that time, so we have 1964, is when Kitty Genovese was murdered. And you probably maybe remember this story um, but but quickly, she's a, she's a white woman who was killed in Kew Gardens, Queens. And the story that we were all told at the time from the New York Times was that um, she was raped and murdered right outside her apartment door. And there were 57 neighbors who saw and heard what was going on and no one called the police. And that's the story that Abe Rosenthal at the New York Times told about that incident. It turns out many years later, that was not true. There weren't that many people that saw what happened. Some people did call the police. Um, other people um, who called the police called the police and they said, don't worry about it, we're not coming. It's not a, it's not a problem. The other thing that Abe Rose, Rosenthal did when he told that story in the New York Times is that he, he removed several facts about Kitty Genovese's life. And one of those was that she was a lesbian and she was going home to her lover that night and that was the one year anniversary of them getting together it was the night that she was murdered. None of that appeared in the press at the time because part of what Abe Rosenthal was doing was he was working with the police to, um, to promote the police, the NYPD specifically, and to promote the idea of this national emergency call number. Lots of uh, jurisdictions around the country didn't want it because it was expensive and so, um, then when the rest of the uprisings happened in the 60s after the murder of Dr. King, um, there was the Kerner Commission. And one of the recommendations out of the Kerner Commission report was that there be a national response, a number that was just three digits. And then there was federal funding for it. And that's how we got the 911 system, which now really works to serve white people's interests and comfort and often results in the death of people of color 
and sometimes results in the death of even white women. There's a story just recently in the New York Times about a woman, a white woman, who was shot uh, by the police after someone called 911. They're often called uh, for mental health emergencies, and that um, is simply not um, a good use of the police and it's not effective and often ends at people's deaths. Um, but it's also a huge waste of um, resources, right? That is meant to make white people feel more comfortable. So that I think is sort of an emblematic case of how technology and whiteness works together. There's a way in which we think this technology is making us more secure or safer, but it's actually really for the secure, for the notional security, not even our actual security, but the idea that we're more safe uh, for some white people, um, but it doesn't work for everybody. And it's, it reinforces state power and, um, you know, and ultimately is a jobs program um, that is part of a machine that kills people. Um, and and how, so how does um, Sheryl Sandberg fit into that? Well, I mean, part of what we, part of what's so interesting to me about Sheryl Sandberg, and I think this is the perfect group to talk about this with, is she get, she like skates, you know, like in terms of responsibility for Facebook. I mean, all the stuff that comes out about Facebook is um, about, you know, is about Zuckerberg and certainly he bears a lot of responsibility, but there's a way in which she doesn't kind of, uh, she hasn't held to account for her role in the, in the huge surveillance mechanism that they've built with uh, Facebook. And just recently there was a prosecutor in the news talking about, um, it was with the uh, hip hop case in Atlanta. And they were talking about um, the people that just got arrested, I'm forgetting their names, but they, um, the prosecutor in that case is saying, yes, social media is a great benefit to us to uh, prosecuting cases. So this tool that Sandberg has been, you know, uh, crucial, in developing and expanding has been, um, you know, really destructive in a way that she never seems to be held account for. And I'm just gonna stop there. <laughs> wow. Yes. A lot. Yes, I am. <laughs> so I know that we're gonna be opening up for questions pretty soon. So I encourage anybody to put them into the Q and A, but I am gonna sneak in my last one before audience questions. And it really does um, take us back to Sandberg and technology. So one of the things that you and I have done in the years since we've left, are a number of different talks with tech companies. And usually that has come through some email from diversity and inclusion um, who have um, you know, asked one or both of us to come. And then we've kind of double teamed. And one of the things that has stood out to me in the years that I've worked in this field is how diver both diversity and inclusion is usually a white woman, a bunch of white, women who are then charged with kind of opening the doors of tech to um, us all. And I'm wondering just based on the kind of total research that you had to do with that, I would love for you to speak a little bit more about um, how you view number one, why white women have located themselves in that position of like, you know, the oppressed, uh, when in many ways, the decisions that are made, even within diversity and inclusion, uphold harmful systems. That's kind of one question. And then my final question before we open it up to the audience is what is the hope for white women? And what is your call to white women through this book? Great. Thanks so much, Mitali. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I want to say something about without disclosing any uh, specifics that might uh, be detrimental for anybody. But I just wanna talk a little bit about an event that Mutali invited me to, um, to speak at a tech company that we would all know if I called the name, but I shan't. Um, and you know, we did our uh, sort of conversation about diversity, equity, inclusion in tech companies. And I made the grave error of using the phrase white supremacy. And I just could see the faces go blank. And it was just like everybody stopped listening across the Zoom. And you know, it was clear to me that they, they were not gonna have me back. Um, but, but there's a way in which white women, and I'm gonna talk sort of generally here about white women in tech, 
but it's it also applies to to us as white women sort of more broadly but there's a way in which we have taken the lesson from feminism that we are victims that we are oppressed and that is all that we are right so it's a what i call in the book a gender only lens and that's super detrimental and let me tell you why and this is actually going to circle back to the question that um Sarita posed last time that I didn't get to answer about the far right women. And part of what um, uh, part of what happens when we take a gender only lens it, and we don't have race at the at the center, the beginning conversation of our understanding of feminism, is that it inevitably maps onto white supremacy. And so when I did the cyber racism book, I spent a lot of time at Stormfront. There was a place there within Stormfront called the Ladies Only Forum. And part of what I found at that forum was that these women of the far right, I mean, they had, they had logged on and registered an ID at Stormfront. So they were down with that cause. And in the Ladies Only Forum, I, it sounded like a, a meeting at NOW, you know, the National Organization of Women. It sounded like any ordinary sort of liberal feminist gathering. You know, they would talk about, you know, uh, gender in this very antiquated binary sort of way, you know, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And they kind of regarded men as sort of silly. And, you know, they thought that sexism was outdated. And, and of course they believed in equal pay for equal work. And, um, you know, and they would post things about how ridiculous men were. And then, and then they would talk about abortion rights and they absolutely there for abortion rights, but they were, they were arguing that the wrong people were having abortion, right? It was, it was that white women had too many abortions and that women of color didn't have enough, right? So again, we're back to that domestic supply of infants thing, right? So there's something about the way that we as white women have seen ourselves as only oppressed, as only ever victims of oppression. I wanted to give just one more example of that because I think it's important. And that's that, um, you know, when I was in graduate school, so this is late eighties, early nineties, uh, what I learned in those women's and gender studies classes was that white women, that all women could not own property. That was just like from, you know, 1960 to prehistory, white women couldn't own, own property. But as we've learned from Stephanie Jones Rogers and her wonderful historical work in They Were Her Property, we know that white women could be slave owners in the American context. And part of how we know that um, is that they uh, would get bequests, again, inherited property from their fathers, or they would get, um, they would become co-owners with their husbands. And part of what they would try to do with that um, provisional power of owning slaves in this way was to um, be incredibly cruel, would be, to be extra cruel to prove their metal, as it were, as slave owners, right? We think you you shouldn't be able to do this, so I'm gonna uh, show you how good I am at it. And it, it's what it's a really stomach turning book. It's really hard to read, actually, but it's very important. Uh, one reviewer at the New York Times called that cruelty that's in the book a kind of imaginative sadism, and I think that's such an apt phrase because I think it. To me, it made me think of my grandmother, my mother's mother, and the way that she treated her daughter, my mother growing up, was with this imaginative sadism. I mean, she would beat her until she bled, and it was, it was horrific, but it was so outsized, the kind of abuse that she visited on my mother. It was so outsized, I've always been puzzled by it. You know, like, where did that come from? And when I read Stephanie Jones Rogers' books, I was like, oh, that's where it comes from, right? It's from this inheritance about slavery that's been passed down. Now, I don't know if any of my family personally owned slave. My guess is that, I've, I've looked and I haven't found any records. My guess is that our family was, was among the people who you could rent enslaved people. And when I learned that fact, I was like, oh, that was my people. <laughs> like we're renters and not owners. Um, so white women only seeing ourselves as oppressed denies the fact that we can also be oppressors. And that was true during uh, racial slavery, chattel slavery in the United States. And it's true in technology today. That's the hard pill that we can't seem to swallow as white women is that, right, we can be victims, we can be targets of misogyny, but we can also be perpetrators. And that's, that's tough to sit with. Um, so let me turn to the other question is what's the hope? The hope is, and the promise really of this book, I think, 
is that there's joy on the other side of this. Like once we, we do the work of acknowledging our place in this system of racial capitalism, of white supremacy, of settler colonialism, once we acknowledge that and start to do the work of divesting, saying, oh, <laughs> I'm part of that. I don't wanna keep perpetuating that. I wanna pull away from that. I wanna change that system. I want to instead see myself as fully human and stand in solidarity with other human beings. You know, there's this quote from James Baldwin where he says, you know, you, his message to white folks, we just want you to be out here, you know, I'm gonna paraphrase badly here. I'm sorry, Jimmy Baldwin. Um, you know, just out here, you know, struggling and dancing with all the rest of us. And I, I think about that often, you know, that the promise really is kind of what Pia Klemp is doing, right? It's, it's looking at other people as fully human, including people who are refugees and who have brown skin, not just refugees from Ukraine, but looking at people who are refugees in a life draft and saying, oh my God, let me do something in solidarity to help you because I hate to see another human being suffer. And in that, in that solidarity with other humans, there is security and safety and there is joy. So I think that if we can get a hold of how we divest from whiteness and, and back away from perpetuating these systems that are so corrosive to us as nice white ladies and so corrosive to our culture as a whole, that we can really move to a different place where we ourselves are less sort of tormented by what's going on and we can work with other people to really end this in a generation or two. We could really do that. I love that. I am just going to, because we are in the next couple of minutes, going to certainly turn over to the audience, but I just wanted to point out that Jesse and I were meeting with this big global um, tech company to discuss um, advancing racial literacy in tech, which was um, a report that we worked together um, on as, um, as uh, what were we, fellows, um, as fellows. So you two audience members could, could maybe uh, do that too, and we get lots of requests. So thank you for that. Um, so Sarita, I am going to hand to you because I know you're gonna um, uh, handle the audience questions, but thank you so much. And may this be read by all women everywhere. I love the book, thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you, Jesse. Those last comments were really incredible. And um, it's so important to think about ways to move towards a different model of safety and security. Uh, we have a question in the chat that reads, can you unpack more your statement? It is in white women's interests because their interests, because of their interest in whiteness or their interest is whiteness to support Trump. I would love to hear more about this. I think we'd all love to hear more about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. There are lots of ways. So just going back to the, I, I kind of have to answer this. I have to start with uh, my wonderful colleague, Jonathan Metzl and his book, Dying of Whiteness, right? So, so his argument, which I, which I, you know, build on and basically add gender to, um, his argument is that there are ways in which whiteness, uh, sorry, let me back up. His argument is that there are ways in which white people be, become to a come to associate certain policies with white identity. So he looks at different policies and I'm gonna forget all of them, but one of them is guns and the other one is ACA, right? The Obamacare. So let's talk about, I mean, guns is kind of obvious, right? They're white people who, <laughs> there are white people who associate having a gun with their own freedom, right? That, and that we see that all, all the time, right? You can't take my gun away from me and that's kind of who I am as a person, right? That's a very common thing that we see among white people, you know, mostly outside of New York City. Um, but there are other ways that this works. And one of the great stories that Metzl tells in that, in that book is of a guy that he interviewed, I think it's a pseudonym named Trevor. And Trevor um, is dying of a liver disease and it actually is quite painful. And if Trevor could, could sign up for, would sign up for Obamacare or ACA, he could get treatment for that liver disease. Not only would his pain be lessened, but he would live longer. So this guy's in pain and he's gonna die sooner. And Metzl asks him, why don't you sign up for ACA, Obamacare? He's like, I would rather die than sign up for ACA because I don't want my tax dollars going to quote Mexicans and welfare queens, end quote. 
And that to me is like the, the way that whiteness gets married onto a uh, policy, right? So I'm, I'm white and I care about that and I'm invested in it. So I'm not gonna do this thing that would bring me less pain and, and extend my life, right? So how does that work for white women? I think for white women, it's quite gendered in the sense that we often see whiteness as attached to our families. One of the things I argue in the book is that, you know, there's gotta be a way that white families, there's gotta be a way that white parents can figure out how to not pass along whiteness to their children. And when I say this to white audiences, people laugh, they roll their eyes, they say, well, that's impossible. And what that response tells me is that white parents, white people think that whiteness is innate and it's natural and, it, and you cannot stop it. And I just think that that is not true. <laughs> I mean, we, we know that whiteness is this construction. So where does, it, where does it start? Where does it come from? And part of the place it starts is in families. I'm gonna just tell a slightly funny story to, to lighten this a little bit, but there's a great um, series that's on FX now called um, Atlanta and you know by Danny Glover. I don't know if you've watched it, but season three actually really deals with this issue all the way through the season. And I wanna shout out my wonderful colleague, Calvin Smiley at Hunter College, who put me onto this series for this very reason. But there's this one episode in that season, in season three, where there's this little white kid from a very privileged background in New York City, whose, whose caretaker, whose nanny is Trinidadian and she passes away. And the whole episode is about this white kid going to this uh, Trinidadian caretaker's uh, funeral and his parents finally coming to realize that their child, their little white boy child has been raised by this Trinidadian woman. And so he's kind of as Trinidadian as some of the people at the funeral and they are the outsiders from their kid. So I mean, I just think that we are way before the beginning of trying to figure out how we divest from whiteness in child rearing, right? So I think that's one of the hardest pieces, um, but there's certainly a way that, that white, nice white ladies um, are invested in their whiteness. And I, and I see it when I push back on white, like, well, what if you didn't do this? And it's like, oh, well, wait a minute. I, ha I have to do that. That's just natural, right? Nope. Thank you, Jesse. I just want to shout out that last question came from Christy and Kim, a fantastic question. And I really appreciated that answer. We have a question from Rigoberto Lara Guzman who asks, in light of the residential boarding school catastrophe and the historical removal of Native children, can you speak about the role the white family mythos played yeah. in the dispossession of Native land? Yes, thank you very much for that question. I actually talk about that in the book and white women have been uh, instrumental in the establishment and the administration and the continuation of um, these, uh, they're called boarding schools sometimes, sometimes they're called rever reservation schools, sometimes they're called Indian schools. Um, and they're terrible um, fact um, that was created in the United States as well as in Australia. And the, the idea behind these schools, if you're not familiar with them, was that, um, that white women uh, thought that they could parent the uh, indigenous children better than their own mothers. And, and so part of that was about removing children from their families and putting them in boarding schools and quite explicitly indoctrinating them into whiteness and into the dominant white culture, both in the US and in Australia. So that was an intentional project. Um, and it is not only historical, right? And, and we also know, I should also say that, that those were, you know, not only were those genocidal institutions that were about wiping out culture, but they were genocidal in practice, right? There were children who were murdered in those schools and then buried in the backyard. I mean, and that's what's being uncovered now is how many of those young uh, indigenous children were murdered at those schools and buried in the, in the backyard of those schools. So it's horrible, horrible practice. However, it is not only something of centuries ago, it is an ongoing practice. And right now it looks a lot like adoption and foster care. 
So I want to shout out the wonderful podcast called This Land by Rebecca Nagel. And she has a recent episode called Supply and Demand, which really goes into how um, the adoption system is trying to, um, is really working to remove Native children from their, from their families and place them with white families. Similar thing happening at the southern border of the US. Those children who've been captured in cages, which by the way, Kristen Nielsen, a white woman, was the administrator in the Trump administration who was in charge of that policy and making sure that it worked and she was enthusiastic behind it. So those children trapped in those cages at our southern border, they are being adopted by uh, Christian, white Christian evangelicals who see themselves on a mission to um, save those children. And this is often led by white women. So this is again, a genocidal practice that's happening you know, with the, the state, capital S state of the US government that is fueled by, by some white women, some evangelical white women's desire to save these children from their own families. And again, this goes back to this idea that white women are the best mothers, are the most well-suited mothers. I glanced by that slide of Princess Diana, but this is a global phenomenon as well. If we think about the, you know, the UN ambassadors like uh, Angelina Jolie and I can't remember the other ones that have been the UN ambassadors, but basically they pick a white woman at the UN to go, you know, hold, uh, the children with brown skin and other cultures and, and sort of raise awareness about various things. But, but part of what those images do, you know, that one image I showed of Diana where she's kind of, she's at a point where she's moving away from that marriage and she's trying to establish herself as a, as a public figure. But, but what those photographs of her do is they sort of cast her in this beautiful angelic light, right? And then she's holding this child in her arms of darker skin, who's frail or sickly. And part of what that image tells us is that she is the good mother. And, and whoever this child's actual biological mother was didn't do a good enough job. And so now we're gonna rescue that child from their mother and give it to a white woman who could really take care of it. And that notion is baked into our foster care and adoption system. Um, and is part of what um, Dorothy Roberts talks about in her new book, Torn Apart. Thanks, Jesse. The questions are rolling in and they're all amazing. So I'll quickly shout out Adia Benton, who notes hey, Salma you. Hayek, uh, throws a wrench into, into this uh, narrative about white women ambassadors. There's not a question there, but I'm going to put two questions together. One is from Pinky Flota and one is from Allegra Fonda Bonardi. And they're both asking about alternatives. So Pinky writes, I teach at Smith College where white feminism is paradigmatic. How can I teach whiteness and race in ways that go beyond evoking white guilt and is somehow more productive as a call to arms? And there's a through line in there with Allegra's question about how we can um, continue and deepen the distinction between not passing on whiteness and 1990s style not seeing color. Can you see the last question again? I didn't quite get it. The question is back to the discussion about whiteness and child rearing. And she wants oh. to deepen the distinction between oh. not passing on whiteness and color. Oh, whiteness. right, 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 right. Right, so to the to the person writing from uh, from Smith and the paradigmatic white feminism of, of that place, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the, one of the ways to do that is to really, um, you know, one of the things I said in the beginning was that we who are raised to be white are not practiced at noticing whiteness. But, but I also think that it's not, it's actually not a very big hill to climb. So I, I think even like when I do like an hour like this, by the end of it, people are like bringing up other examples. Well, what about this? It's like, yeah, that's another example of it. So it's, so it's kind of like a thing that once you see it, you can't unsee it, right? And, and we get, as we, get more practiced at it, as we get more skilled at it, we begin to see it more often. <laughs> I don't, I don't think we'll, anyway, I don't think we'll ever be the most skilled, but we can do better than we have. So I think that for uh, professors, and I think this is true at lots of places besides Smith, but at predominantly white institutions, the thing is that, is that piece I was saying just at the very beginning, which is we've got to be able to name the subject position of white women 
if we're going to be scholars at all, right? Do, do we want to understand the world that we're in or do we not? And if we do, then we have to take account of the, of the outsized place that we as white women hold in the culture. You know, so one of the exercises, just the college professor to college professor, one of the exercises I use sometime in my classes is to have is to have my students do a content analysis of that Vanity Fair issue, right? So we've got, I think, a couple of decades now of Vanity Fair doing that Hollywood issue, which they do every spring. So just have, have your students, like, don't even tell them what to think about it, right? Just have them do the research, like, go count Vanity Fair, do, you know, a little table, how many people are on the cover, how many are white, how many are not, are Black, Indigenous, other people of color, tell me, tell me what that means, right? And I really think that young people today are super interested in having these discussions. I really do believe that. So I think that, that they are going to be grateful for a way to language this, right? A way to understand what they're seeing around them and how to move forward, right? How to be Pia Klemp, right? Instead of all these other bad examples that we have, right? Right, and then the one on child rearing, right? There's a, there is a much deeper discussion and I'm sad that we don't have more time to talk about it, but I just wanna talk about the, um, there's a wonderful book by, uh, Mag, I think it's um, Maggie ha Hagerman, I think is her name, uh, White Kids, anyway, is the, is the name of the book. And she talks, she does this wonderful ethnographic study of two sets of white families, one who are sort of raising their children to be colorblind and the other who are raising their children to be more, aware she says anti-racist, but, but, but my intervention here is to say, is there something beyond that? Because I think if we're raising children, even to be anti-racist, we're still anchoring them in whiteness, right? And there's a wonderful theologian named Fendika um, who writes that, you know, passing on whiteness to your children is actually a form of child abuse. And I resisted that argument when I first read it, but I, I've become persuaded by it. And two quick stories, if I can, to end with. One was um, about the couple in New Jersey who named their son Adolf Hitler Campbell or whatever it was, and Child Protective Services was called because clearly that's not okay and that's a form of child abuse. And I was like, well, yes, I agree with that. And then the other example I have is from a wonderful uh, documentary film called, uh, I, can't, I can't say the Chinese, I'm sorry, uh, but it's called I Love You, Mommy about a young uh, Chinese girl, she's like eight years old, adopted from Gangju uh, province in China and is brought to um, the US and lives on Long Island with her white Jewish parents. And there's something about that movie which is so painful watching this young girl go through this process that we as sociologists call acculturation, but is a kind of violence really. Um, and my, my students really are the ones that hit me to this. They were like, that looks like child abuse. And I was like, you know what? I think you're right. So I think there is a way that the learning whiteness, you have to be like this, is a kind of child abuse that we have to think about more thoughtfully, more carefully. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Jesse. <clears throat> that was absolutely amazing. Please, everybody, buy Jesse's book. It's absolutely wonderful. Listen to the audio book. Um, and we're at time, so I'm just going to say thank you on behalf of Data and Society to Mutale and Jesse. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much.